makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. The Bank of Japan sticks with the world's last remaining negative interest rate. Well, Governor Kazuo Ueda says it's hard to give an exit plan with any certainty. Activist investor Sevian Capital takes a 1.2 billion euro stake in UBS, betting that the Credit Suisse integration will pay dividends. Plus, the U.S. and its allies announce a task force to protect shipping in the Red Sea as threats to vessels begin to impact global trade. So, good morning. A lot going on on this Tuesday morning. Let's have a look at the European markets map. Again, a lot of the focus is on oil at a two-week high. A lot of the focus is on shipping, whether a lot of what happened with liquefied natural gas tankers now extending to oil means that global trade will have to go around Africa. This adds a lengthy amount of time. So there are worries about shipments and supply going forward. Now, for the moment, you can see we're in a little bit of a holding pattern. The CAC down one-tenth of eight percent. Uh, the FTSE here in the UK is pretty much unchanged. The DAX is gaining two-tenths of eight percent. We have three stories we really want to tell you about. First of all, UBS. We'll have a great roundup of banking and what that means going forward. And then we actually have quite a lot of analysts um, that have been steadfast saying that interest rates will not go lower, now having to reverse that. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. You can see UBS on the back of that 1.2 billion euro uh, stake from Sinvian, 1.8% higher. So UBS shares gaining this morning. And that's after, as we were saying, a 1.2 billion uh, euro bet on the Swiss lender. The activist investor reckons the takeover of Credit Suisse could, be, could see UBS double its share price, but also secure its spot as a number one global wealth manager. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Paul Davies from Bloomberg Opinion. Paul, I'm so glad you're here because actually you understand uh, banking. You've been following activist investors for quite some time. Now, when this broke this morning, a lot of people said, okay, 1.2 billion, they have 1.4% of UBS. It's not huge, but do we have any idea of what their intentions are? So, well, you say it's not huge. I mean, it's not huge in the scale of UBS, but it's big for them, right? I mean, right. they've got like $12 billion yep. under management or something, so it's a good 10% of, nearly 10% of what they uh, run. I mean, in terms of their plans, so we just had the CEO yep. talking before. I mean, it's, it's quite an unusual position, I think, for Sevian in the sense that we typically expect them to be this kind of very quiet, behind the scenes, but engaged and activist. You know, they want to change things. They want to influence what the management does. This one, they've come out and announced it to the world and say they don't really want to do anything uh, immediately. So it's, kind of, it's a bit of a head scratcher in a sense. It looks more like a kind of a, a, a sort of a value investment than, than an activist position. But... Um, I guess, yeah, we can talk a bit more about what he actually said, the CEO. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question, Paul, is that at the moment, the integration, and it's crazy to think, and you've been covering this right from the start, it was only in March that UBS took over Credit Suisse. Yeah. I mean, 2023 for Swiss banking was like an epic year. How's the integration going? Like, what did we hear from the chief executive that, that makes you positive about UBS? So, uh, I mean, I guess we just had the, the Q3 results, and the interesting thing there was everything was moving faster uh, than people had expected. They were cutting costs faster, cutting unwanted assets faster than people had expected. And they'd also, on the really positive side, managed to attract... Uh, more deposits back than maybe people had expected, which is like, you know, the restoration of, of faith in the, in the kind of the running of the bank and so on and so forth. However, you know, longer term, the kind of the interesting thing about what they were doing is a lot of the cost, costs, costs that they cut yeah. were the easy ones to cut. They were from the investment bank. There was a lot of bankers who got up and walked away because they saw the yeah. writing on the wall. And the next stage is going to be the much harder part, you know, the, the wealth management business and even more so the Swiss business a much more traditional mm. business integrations, especially in Switzerland, where you have to be very sensitive to the, the politics, to you know, employees, and it's going to be a much more costly and longer term, more difficult integration to manage. So that would be the thing to watch. But is this the last thing that management needed? Again, they're, you know, they're building the plane whilst flying the plane, because they still have to run it, but still integrating parts of Credit Suisse. And how you, you have this activist, or maybe not so active investor, mm. how would they be feeling this morning? Um, I mean... Well, so Sevian has come out and, and sort of issued this sort of statement in faith in the management. I mean, the CEO of Sevian uh, just earlier was saying they think the management's great, they think they're doing the right sort of things. They have their eye on sort of three to five years' time. They want to kind of influence the longer-term strategy, you know, how not so much the integration but what UBS builds and what it becomes sort of, you know, from, from there on. So, I mean, I think, you know, initially at least, the management of UBS ought to feel 
somewhat supported okay. by this. You know, it's, it's a vote of confidence, as I say. Um, but, yeah, we'll see, you know, what tensions might arise. I mean, Sevian is an engaged investor. They will have views. Uh, they said they've been speaking to the management, you know, uh, a number of times already since starting to buy their stake earlier this year after, after the Credit Suisse deal. So, so, yeah, we'll see uh, whether there is a difference of opinion further down the track, I guess. Um, so, Paul, you were my, one of my favourite finds for 2023 because you've come on air quite a lot. It's F SVB. We've had just a big year for, for banking. You know, Jane Fraser at Citigroup has been changing quite a lot of stuff, questions about Goldman Sachs. What are you most or least looking forward to for 2024 in the banking space? Well, I mean, I guess it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, big stories are going to be about, you know, the recovery of investment banking, deal-making, capital markets, you know, whether that happens, I think that might come in fits and starts. We're probably going to get some surprises on you know, growth, inflation, interest rates, maybe in the first sort of three, six months of the year. So we might see a burst of activity and then a bit of a slowdown and then maybe activity recovering again. Consolidation? Consolidation. Um, I mean, a lot of them, we spoke to Unicredit, I mean, they, they have quite a lot of, you know, cash ready yeah. to put to good use, but yeah. I don't know whether it's a transformational I mean, deal. I think that with Unicredit, they want to you know, add uh, stable revenue-producing businesses in sort of asset management insurance type area. It seems very unlikely that they're going to go out and do any kind of like major transformational you know, bank deal. I mean, these things are still very, very hard unless you've got a regulator telling you to do it. Um, Paul, final question. Do you think we're going to get more activist investors? I mean, if you look at the valuations are quite cheap, given what some of these companies are, are trying to achieve. Mm. And I don't know whether it's just more blocks of cash into, you know, European banks because they seem undervalued. So uh, activist investors don't have a fantastic history in banking. No. We had, you know, Knight Frankie, uh, Knight Vink, sorry, in... Um, in, uh, in, in HSBC. Barclays and HSBC. We had, uh, uh, yep. Yeah, Edward Bramson in Barclays. Uh, none of those things did particularly well. I mean, Sevian has done well in the past with, with its Nordic bank stakes. But, I mean, but it's, it's, very, it's very hard. And a lot of the banks that are troubled, I mean, such as you know, Barclays at the moment, one of the most lowest valued uh, banks in Europe, the, the struggle is, is how do you really change a business that big without really disrupting it without doing something radical like selling an investment bank, which they've just spent years telling yeah. this investor that they don't want to do uh, and they're not going to do. It's, it's, um, it's a very difficult area, I think, to really change businesses, mm. the very large businesses that are very entrenched in, in what they do, to change them radically enough to really make a difference. All right, Paul, thank you so much. Paul Davies there from Bloomberg Opinion. Paul also has a great story, actually, today on AI and banking. Now, we heard a short time ago from Lars Forberg, co-founder and managing partner of Sieven Capital. Here he is. Management and board have laid out a very clear strategy over the next couple of years in integrating Credit Suisse into UBS. And it's going to create the largest uh, global wealth manager it's going to be an uh, incredible business uh, covering uh, basically the entire globe. And outside of the U.S., it's going to be three times larger than its closest competitor. And we support that process. Uh, and management have described that um, they're doing the integration work now with the view of building mm. a much uh, the strongest potential bank three, five years from now. And that's what we're supporting. Well, that was Lars Forberg, the co-founder and managing partner of Sivian Capital. Now, Germany will also sell a smaller volume of federal debt next year, this just breaking on the Bloomberg terminal, as the government continues to wind down aid earmarked to offset the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the energy crisis. Now, the German government plans to issue about 440 billion euros in debt. That's according to a statement published by the Federal Finance Agency. Now, that does compare with the volume of around 500 billion euros in 2020. Three. Now, more to come. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. We talk yen, we talk Bank of the Pan, and we'll talk Fed. This is Bloomberg. Now, the Bank of Japan has stuck with the world's lost negative interest rate today and offered no guidance on whether it might scrap the policy. The yen fell to its lowest level in almost a week. JGB futures pushed 
higher after the decision. Now, joining us now is Citigroup's global equity strategist, Beata Manthi. Beata, thank you so much for, I guess, finishing off the year. I mean, it, it's a big, big news flow today. And many were surprised that the BOJ did not give any forward guidance. Is this because it's so difficult to give visibility or is it just the way the new governor will work? Well, it remains to be seen, but what it, we haven't, as you mentioned, we haven't heard too much news out of them today. Of course, the end has held uh, its move. And for me as an equity strategist, what is the most important, and actually for the, um, for the Japanese uh, equity market, is of course the direction of yen, right? So we do, we do expect more from BOJ into the next year, but perhaps this further move up on yen strengthening is halted for now. But so, Beata, I have to say it's been like two years that I have, you know, the biggest, bravest call has always been buy Japanese equities. Like, yes. what's a good entry point? Like, when does it actually happen? So Japanese equities have done very well this year, right, on the back of this uh, big weakness uh, out of yen, on the back of better than expected macroeconomic backdrop this year. And Japan has also benefited from lots of inflows that would have been directed into China. But because of geopolitical risks, investors have decided uh, to move them uh, to Japan. So Japan has done very well. Um, the strength in the end into the next year could be a headwind. But of course, this balance, this more dovish rhetoric from the central banks around the world means that the, the balance of risks for a harder landing for next year is decreasing. And for a cyclical market like um, Japanese equities, uh, it's a positive, of course. So what's your take on U.S. equities? I know there's been like this massive shift, mainly because of Jay Powell, but there's a, you know, what's being priced in the market is up to like four, even five Fed cuts for, um, you know, 2024. That's that's big. It is big, absolutely. City economists out of the U.S. expect four, so that's much more. But of course, the dovish rhetoric that we've heard means that the risks to more and earlier cuts are plausible. Whether it's eight remains to be seen. Perhaps the market is a bit over-optimistic there. Yeah, and it's been like this for a while. Let's also uh, talk about shipping in the Red Sea. Let's bring in Al Nightingale. Now, Al, you follow this very closely, and it's been, you know, th this is basically linked to um, Gaza and Hamas and Israel and the fact that Houthis are now attacking tankers, I guess, in the Red Sea, and so that route is almost closed off. Like, where are we on this? Um, it has is, is shut down significantly. Um, we thought about a third of transits have been cut so um, it, it is coming off sharply. It's really, I think, container shipping is actually the thing that has been most affected. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think could be the most affected because it's a very um, logistics-heavy industry. So with oil tankers, they, they can go to different ports, deliver different cargo to different locations. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about container shipping, it runs, you know, like clockwork normally. So when something goes wrong like this, they all run late. And, and there's been huge disruption to that part of the fleet. Yeah, and I think we have a map. I wish we had an app. I think we'll get a map up for you. But basically, if they go around Africa, I mean, this is what, that's an extra three weeks to get things from A to B. Yeah, it's that, that order of magnitude, lots more fuel costs, um, things arriving at ports when they weren't expected to. As I say, you've got a whole supply chain on both sides that um, is affected by that. So the, um, tank, the, the container ships arriving in, say, Rotterdam, getting late and, you know, unexpectedly, you know, delayed and again they're going to be late getting back to Asia. We saw with the um, ever given when that blocked the Suez Canal that it caused significant snarl ups in the kind of logistics chain. So Beata, how does that translate into your world of equities? Again, if oil price goes up, if there's a lot of uncertainty, then that's another headache for chief executives. Of course, and that's yet another reminder that geopolitical risks are with us to stay, right? So that's definitely a worry. Now, the, the biggest translation mechanism, of course, is higher inflation. But these disruptions would have to stay for a much prolonged period of time to have an effect actually on the, on the indices. So, Beata, where do you find the most value when you look at equities across the world? I know Europe still looks cheap. But it looks cheap maybe for a reason. The UK is cheap. Again, that could be for a reason. W how do you construct a portfolio right now? So the way we are positioned in our global portfolio, we are overweight continental Europe. We've moved it to overweight um, over the summer. Uh, 
seeing this balance of risks improving, not to sound overly optimistic, the outlook is still quite dire into the next year, but it's less bad than we thought it would be. And cyclical markets like Europe uh, have priced that in. What we are, we've been underweight for some time is actually the UK market. Okay. And that's because of our bearish view on the oil. Of course, what is happening right now is creating some volatility and, mm -hmm. and the FTSE 100 is very, um, very correlated to what the oil prices are doing. And we are neutral in the US and neutral in Japan at the moment. Um, Beata, I mean, we also have this huge election which kind of ties to geopolitics. We have the US, we have 40 countries overall. I think 60% of world GDP citizens go to the polls next year. I mean, again, how, how do you calculate risk for earnings or for, for companies? It all depends what policies are going to come with, the, with winning these elections, but it's definitely a record year in terms of uh, elections, and that means that geopolitical risks will persist definitely uh, into the next year. But we calculate that actually there is already quite, because we, we've been having them for over two years now, right? So there is a lot of geopolitical risk premium already embedded in the markets, especially in the cyclical markets like Europe, mo among the developed markets, most exposed equity markets to geopolitical risks. And Al, talking about geopolitics, I mean, the Defense Secretary of the U.S. also is talking about this maritime task force to actually help in the Red Sea. I mean, concretely, does that, you know, could it unblock things or is it dangerous? Uh, clearly, the, the Iran-backed Houthis, perhaps they want to draw the U.S. into more of a conflict. So I think that's why you've seen the U.S. treading carefully um, in its approach to this. So, yes, it could be dangerous. Uh, yes, it could also secure things without question. You, you know, just use military might and maybe attack at source and some of these things do subside. Um, but you saw today Maersk have said it's going to send its ship the long way around after no. the US statement. So clearly they've taken a view, well, yes, it, I mean, I imagine that they expect some kind of improvement in the security situation. But when a huge company like Maersk says it's going to go the long way around after that statement, it tells you something. Yeah, alarm bells with a lot of investors. Thank you so much, Al Nightingale of Bloomberg, Beata Manthi, Citigroup's global equity strategist, stays with us. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more about the sectors she likes. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Now, we talk a little bit about tech. Apple, we understand, is just days away from a U.S. ban on its smart watches. And so according to people familiar with the situation, it's now actually plotting a rescue mission for this business that for Apple is worth some $17 billion. And so they're trying to do some software fixes and other potential workarounds because a, a, a device that measures a user's blood oxygen level um, the a company has argued that it infringes its patents. And so now they're trying to adjust the technology to be able to continue to sell those, of course, uh, smartwatches. We'll keep that very close to uh, some of our top stories and we'll get a full roundup a little bit later on. Let's also get back to Citigroup's global equity strategist, Beata Mantina. Beata, when you look at technology around the world, when you look at valuations, I mean, these were the big winners probably over the last two years. Is more to come? So... Tech is a very special sector that has been driven so much by what the rates have been doing, right? So it's re-rated as rates uh, when were low and derated last year heavily uh, as rates were going higher. We've been negative last year all the way to March. In March, we've upgraded tech to overweight uh, both in Europe and, in, uh, and globally taking some profits into the summer, I, it went, it did well, and then in um, September put it again to, to an overweight, uh, thinking it's going to be the biggest beneficiary of a pivot from the central bank. So, of course, these moves have unwound quite uh, quickly. The market readjusted to the new levels of expectations from interest rates. And our view is that for the next year, it's going to be about the delivery of fundamentals. So what your earnings are going to do to, to support the valuations, right? But, but I guess the question for me is, it's, I don't understand yet whether central banks would cut interest rates as inflation comes down or whether they're cutting rates because there's a big recession looming. And so I imagine that changes everything in how you want to play equities. 
Absolutely. So the assumption of the market right now is that this more dovish pivot from the Fed decreases the odds of recession, right? We, we are going to have a slowdown, but the question is how deep it's going to be. So over the next few months, we'll be absolutely concentrated on signs of weakness or relative strength versus what has been expected, right? So again, it's, a, it's about the rate of expectation and, and deltas. Is it better than we thought it would be? We, we know it's going to be a slowdown, right? And, and that yet uh, remains to be seen. So, so that's, I guess, the, the optimistic point of view. Let's say it's a slowdown, but they manage to cushion it. What does it mean for other sectors that you like, apart from tech? So in Europe, uh, we are basing our view a lot on the fact that the cyclical markets like Europe has priced in quite a lot of bad news into the price. We think earnings will, be, will get downgraded, they'll be downgraded, but the pricing of the market is much more bearish. The market is already pricing it a contraction. So with this pivot from the central banks, perhaps we get away with, uh, with, with a smaller slowdown or, or lower recession. So we are... Um, from October, we were all full on cyclicals, especially growth cyclicals, downgraded defensives. But last week, after this big rally, we've, we've added some defensiveness into the, uh, into into the mix. Beata, thanks so much. As always, Beata Manti. Well, the Bank of Japan sticks with the world's last remaining negative interest rate. Governor Kazuo Ueda says it's hard to give an exit plan with any certainty. Activist investor Sevian Capital takes a 1.2 billion euro stake in UBS, betting that the Credit Suisse integration will pay dividends. Plus, the U.S. and its allies announce a task force to protect shipping in the Red Sea as threats to vessels begin to impact global trade. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So shipping in the Red Sea is under threat as violence linked to the Israel-Hamas war threatens to undermine global trade. Over the weekend, the U.S. and the U.K. navies shot down 15 drones launched from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. Now some of the world's largest shipping companies are now saying that they will pause transit through the waterway. Let's discuss all this with Guy Platten. He's Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Guy, thank you so much for joining us. We also heard from the U.S. Defense Secretary that they will send a task force, a Maritimes task force, to try and deal with the situation. How risky is this? Because maybe the Houthis do want to rope the U.S. into this. I think, firstly, we absolutely condemn what the Houthis are doing to uh, merchant shipping. The, uh, the, the, these innocent seafarers are now being put at risk, and shipping has a right of innocent passage, and it's against all international law. So I think what we do welcome is this broad coalition, the announcement of this broad coalition of navies to help protect and add security to the Red Sea. And clearly, companies are making their decisions based on the current situation. So we, we wait to see further details. But, you know, the, the action of the U.S. Navy and the British Royal Navy in shooting down missiles and drones is to be welcomed because it has protected seafarers. But it could, does it get worse before it gets better? I don't know how much traffic or if it's difficult to actually see how much traffic at the moment is going through the Red Sea. So we're seeing on a daily basis companies now deciding to pause operations in the Red Sea and reroute their ships. So I think uh, there's a couple more companies added last night. BP was yesterday and of course the major container lines uh, have just decided to reroute their ships and bearing in mind it's container traffic is about 22 percent of the traffic that passes through the Red Sea so that's quite a significant impact plus if you look at some of the BP with the tankers as well so there's going to be some significant disruption there is also of course, an alternative route, which is around the, the south coast of South Africa, around the Cape of Good Horn, but that adds 9,000 kilometres or about six to 14 days to a voyage. So clearly there will be disruption um, until I think companies have the, uh, the uh, more, much more confident in the security of their ships transiting the Red Sea. So, Guy, could you explain to us, and, and this is what I was told this morning, that if you're a, a big, you know, tanker actually shipping LNG or shipping oil, you can stop at another port and you have the facilities to be able to move it around. It gets really tricky if you're a cargo ship. Again, does that, how much traffic worldwide could that hit? Is it similar to the Suez Canal a couple of years ago, or is it just a, a different, you know, route in terms of traffic? I mean, it it's a really good analogy because the Suez Canal blocked, was blocked for seven days and ships had to reroute. And that's exactly what shipping companies are deciding to do now. So 
um, that you will see effect on the disruption delays as a result of this. The ships will still be able to take their cargoes to the destination. It'll just be by a different route, a longer route, which will add delay and possible cost as well. But they still can get round. I think Suez ha has more traffic than the Red Sea. Am I right? Yeah, the, well, most traffic will pass through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. So, I mean, it's a vital link between Asia and Europe and, and vice versa. So ships will transit through the Mediterranean Sea, down through the Suez Canal, down to the Red Sea and out to Asia and, and, and vice versa. So by deciding not to go down the Red Sea, they, they won't be transiting through the Suez Canal. So it will have a, an effect on, on, on that but it, it, it can be rerouted, say, around the Cape of Good Hope, yeah. but it does add considerable delay to the voyages. So I, I'm sure you're in contact with the chief executives of Maersk, BP. Are there under any other big companies that you think will reroute? And what, how much, you know, what would it take for them to come back to that route? I think, firstly, the reason why companies are making this decision, and it's there for, it's there for them to make that decision, is primarily on safety grounds. You know, it's the safety of the crew, the safety of the seafarers who, who must be protected. Um, so that's the, the primary driver for all of this. I think once we see the detail of the naval coalition, once we see how it's all going to work, once we see what the effect of, of this increased security in the area will, will be for shipping, companies will then make a, an assessment based on that. But it's, it's very early days for that now. Uh, and we just, I think we need to see the next coming hours and days to see the effect, whether this uh, rerouting is going to be more uh, longer term or is it just a short term disruption. Uh, how worried are you about shipping becoming more dangerous and more expensive in, in the long run? It's been two, three years because of geopolitics, because of the war in Ukraine, because of what we're seeing now, even because of COVID. It, it just feels like it's a very tough time for shipping. It's, uh, I mean, shipping is very resilient. Our seafarers are, are very resilient and they go about their job in a professional manner day to day. But you're quite right, security has uh, become worse globally in the last few years. We had all the disruption from COVID when seafarers were denied access to shore leave or to be even do a crew change. We've got uh, obviously piracy off the, coast, the Gulf of Guinea. There's others in Ukraine, Russia conflict as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's clear that these security tensions are arising and it is a worrying situation for shipping. But Shipping is, again, resilient and will always try and find a way through in the, the, the most safest possible way. Are, are, are you worried about 2024? We have f over 40 countries actually going to elections. We're unclear about where geopolitics end up in five months, six months, eight months. What does that mean for your industry? We, we keep a close eye on everything. I mean, we're a global industry. We're an international industry and, and we move world trade. and. You know, uh, that's that's our that's our you know, they're fourteen trillion dollars worth of goods are traded on ships every year. So it's something, of course, we keep an eye on, and we try and work our way through the situation. But um, unfortunately, I haven't got a crystal ball to to see exactly how it will work out. But it's something that we keep a, a close eye on, and we are worried, and primarily for the, the safety and security of our seafarers. Yeah, Guy, yeah, thank you so much. No one has a crystal ball. A lot of people wish they had. Guy Platten, Secretary <laughs> General there of the International <laughs> Chamber of Shipping. Now, on to tech, and Apple is also racing against the clock with a software fix for a smartwatch. The tech giant said yesterday that it will be halting sales of some of its devices in the U.S. just days ahead of Christmas due to a patent dispute. So let's get the story now from Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell in Berlin. Aggie, I mean, this is a huge deal. For them, it's worth $17 billion. So how did this complaint actually come about? Yes, Francine. So yes, the $17 billion is the value of the Apple Watch business for Apple. It's essentially about 5% of uh, the company's revenue. It's a significant portion. It's really a point at which it's, it's come at a really difficult time for the company because, of course, Apple, as a consumer tech business, is very focused on those sales over the holiday season. And this uh, ban from the International Trade Commission would come in on Christmas Day. So Apple is taking preemptive action by taking these devices, the Series 9 and the Ultra 2, off their online stores in the US already and, uh, from the 21st of December. And then if you want to do uh, rapid shopping, uh, last minute shopping for Christmas Day, uh, they'll be taking them out of the retail stores on Christmas Eve. And so that's the preemptive action that they're doing. And now what they're hoping for is to have a, a, a potential veto from the White House um, that essentially overturns this order. That would be the best 
best outcome probably for Apple. But as well, Bloomberg has learned that the engineers at Apple are now trying to do a last ditch adaption of um, the software in order so that they would be able to still adapt these products so they're not as heavily dependent on this uh, on this technology which Massimo is arguing is their patent so essentially there are a couple of options for Apple but it is a preemptive option they have decided to take it off their retail stores come the 21st of December Aggie thank you so much it's really quite an incredible story Aggie Cantrell there in Berlin. Now coming up, it's been slated as the most ambitious trade deal ever agreed between the EU and a developing nation. We'll have more on Ursula von der Leyen's trip to Kenya next. This is Bloomberg. Now, Kenya and the European Union have signed an economic partnership agreement. So during a trip to Nairobi, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen met with Kenya's President William Ruto as Brussels pursues stronger economic ties with Africa. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga. Ondiro, so why is this considered the EU's most ambitious trade deal with a developing country in terms of sustainability and development? Well... Francine, it's considered the most ambitious because it has the strongest climate and social commitments that the EU has ever made on any deal it has done in Africa. On the climate front, it's committing to implement the Paris Agreement on climate change and work on combating illegal fishing, logging and wildlife trade. On the social welfare front, it's committing to respect the right of workers, uphold gender equality, and work with civil society groups to advise on how to implement the deal. When we look at the nitty gritties of the agreement, then Kenyan exports will have access um, to tariff-free and quarter-free access to the European Union market. And this is a market of nearly 500 million people. The Kenyan president, William Ruto, says this will not only increase the earning power of farmers, but also create jobs locally in Kenya. So uh, the president of the commission, von der Leyen, has also opened the German tech or the German company BioNTech's vaccine production facility in Kigali. So how important will this be in raising vaccine capacity? This is very important because as is Africa imports 99% of, or rather exports 99% of their vaccine needs and 95% uh, of their drugs. So this just means that the facility will enable Africa to ramp up their vaccine production capacity to about 60% by the year 2040, up from the dismal 1% that we're currently doing. At full capacity, it will be able to churn out 50 million doses annually for um, diseases such as malaria, COVID-19, and TB, and another 10,000 doses for COVID-19. So the goal here is to ramp up production capacity, ensure access to vaccine, improve quality health care on the continent, but also at an affordable price. Ondiro, thank you so much, as always, for coming on. Ondiro Oganga there with the very latest on this trade deal. Now, the Egyptian president, El Sisi, has been re-elected in a landslide victory, winning almost 90% of the votes. The country is experiencing its worst economic strife in decades and faces a prospect of another currency devaluation. Now, for more on this, we're joined from Dubai by Bloomberg's chief emerging markets economist, Ziad Daoud. Ziad, thank you for joining us. So President Sisi's new term now extends to 2030. What are the policies of his new presidency? I mean, for President Abdel Fattah Sisi, winning the elections was sort of the easy part. There was no serious competition. Um, to him in the elections. The hard part is dealing with the economy now that the votes are over. And basically for the economy, there are three priority, priorities. The first one is the currency. It has lost about half of its value since 2022, and it uh, needs to be devalued further. The second priority is the living costs. Egypt inflation is above 30%. And if it devalues the currency further, that means that prices will rise further. And the third priority is debt. Egypt um, is heavily indebted. It pays a large amount of its resources uh, to service that merely paying interest on its debt. Um, so dealing with inflation, dealing with the currency and dealing with the debt situation in Egypt will be the president's priorities in the new term. So on the currency, it's already lost half of the value against the dollar in the last two years. So do you expect more weakness to come? 
Yeah, uh, I think you will get more weakness in the Egyptian currency. Um, basically, there's already a shortage in the market in Egypt with the black market rate already far above the official exchange rate. Egypt runs a trade deficit and it has debt to either repay or roll over, which means it needs more dollars to actually service that. Um, and it doesn't have enough reserves, neither at the central bank nor in the local banking system. So a devaluation is probably inevitable. The two questions are, when is the devalu devaluation is going to happen? And what is the magnitude of it? In terms of magnitude, the black market is basically pricing in about 36% uh, depreciation in the value of the currency. I think Egypt could probably get away with less if it gets funding from either the IMF or the Gulf countries or both. And in terms of the timing, I think when Egypt gets external funds, it will probably devalue the currency whenever that happens. So the president is also now facing a risk with shipping in the Red Sea grinding to a halt. How important is this issue for Egypt? Well, the Suez Canal is very important to Egypt. It's not just uh, an important trade route for the global economy. It's also a source for revenue and income for Egypt. Last year, it got something like over $9 billion out of revenue from the Suez Canal. So disruption there is something really unwelcome, especially in the context of the fact that Egypt has domestic economic hardship that we talked about. It has a war next door in Gaza, which is obviously is affecting Egypt. And it's also a disruption to a trade route and an important source of revenue is something that's definitely not welcome in President Sisi's new term. Ziad, thanks so much. Ziad Daoud there with the very latest, of course, on all of this. In China, more than 100 people have been killed after a 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck the country's northwest late on Monday. Now, most victims were in Gangsu province, one of the poorest regions in China, with hundreds more people injured. While President Xi Jinping has urged officials to go all out with search and rescue operations. Meanwhile, a volcanic eruption is underway in the southwest of Iceland, sending fountains of molten lava hundreds of feet into the sky. At risk are an evacuated town, a power plant, and the country's main tourist attraction, the Blue Lagoon Spa. Well, Iceland's foreign minister says flights continue to operate as normal. A 2010 eruption of another Icelandic volcano, a volcano spewed huge clouds of ash that grounded flights across Europe for days. Now coming up, Bloomberg Economics reckons the price of money is going up, and it's not only because of the Fed. We'll break down our latest research for you next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Well, 2024 could be the year of central bank rate cuts, but the so-called natural rate of interest and everything that flows from it, actually starting with Treasury yields, is destined to stay higher for longer. Now, that's according to Bloomberg Economics, which recently published the research title called The Price of Money is Going Up, and it's not only because of the Fed. Now, here to discuss all of this is our Bloomberg Economics Chief Europe Economist, Jamie Rush. Now, Jamie, I love this piece, so thank you so much for coming on. And it basically argues that, you know, there's a big shift now in expectations from central banks, but the cost of money, which really underpins everything we do and everything that central banks and everything that business do, you, you argue, is not only going up when interest rates were going up, it's more, I guess, structural reasons. Yeah, exactly, Fran. So what, what we've been asking ourselves is what are the fundamental drivers of interest rates, the things which determine how much people want to invest, how much they want to save. These are the things which bring that into balance. So, so it's true, like the Fed does call the shots when it comes to interest rates, but they have to ultimately get interest rates to where this natural rate is. And so we've been looking at the past five decades of experience for about 12 advanced economies uh, and we've tried to disentangle what have been the main drivers of, of why it's all fallen over this period. So, you know, rates real in, real, in real terms, fell by about 300 basis points, we think, on a sustained basis. Partly slower trend growth, partly because all the baby boomers were saving. And, of course, clearly now some of those factors are now spinning into reverse and we're looking at a change in trajectory. And so that's nothing that's going to go away anytime soon. So even if we get cuts from the Fed... I guess the cost of money will still be naturally higher than it would have been otherwise. I think that's it, isn't it? So right now, markets thinking about when the first cut's going to come and how fast the Fed will cut. But you know, ultimately, where are we going to end up? And that's the thing that's, that's driven by these structural determinants. Um, and so we do think that there are some good reasons to think the rates will be higher in the future. 
Uh, one, because the, the, the baby boomers, they're retiring, they're going to be, they're going to be dissaving, they're going to be pushing up interest rates. Um, we're going to see governments continue to borrow, which again is like driving competition for savings and pushing interest rates up. So these are all reasons to think they'll be, it'll be going up a little bit. Also, upside risks. I mean, climate change is going to cost $30 trillion to, to get the, the energy network where we need it to be for net zero. That's obviously going to increase competition for savings. AI could usher in a new period of faster growth, higher interest rates. So there's a lot of things to think about. So, Jamie, I guess, you know, the question is, in, in all of these crises, and we've had to deal with COVID and everything that's ensued since then, wars, geopolitical tensions, do you think some of these, you know, bigger forces at play, like you say, AI, government borrowing, climate change, is kind of lost in how we, we look at things? I, I think we need to take a longer perspective when we're thinking about where Treasury yields will ultimately settle. And so, I mean, if we look at our kind of our base case, we see them somewhere in the four to four and a half percent range. That's based on these fundamental drivers. If you add in the risks from deglobalization, from debt issuance, from the green transition, and from AI, you could easily see it gets more like six percent, and which would obviously be a complete change from what we've been used to over the past 10, 20 years. Jamie, when you look at 2024, I don't know, are you optimistic about anything? Or is it, is it still. <laughs> I, mean, I sound like doom and gloom. I don't want to sound like doom and gloom, but it, it just feels like it's going to be a difficult year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, where, where, are the big risks, where do the big risks lie? I mean, one, I think, is that monetary policy, when you look at any central bank model and you run the hiking cycle that we've seen through those models, you should see GDP down about 4 or 5%, you know, quite a lot. And we haven't seen that. So the question is, is there something different about the way monetary policy is transmitting? Are we measuring it wrong? Or are we going to get it just a bit later and all at once? And I think so that's the fear that we're, we're worried about is that you do get policy transmission and you end up with uh, a 5% hit to GDP in the, you know, in the second half of the next year. And, and I guess the jury is still out when you have the Fed cutting rates, whether it's just to track inflation or whether it's really because they worry about a looming recession. Right. And so if, it's, if we think about inflation alone, I mean, there are questions probably about whether the Fed is or the, the sell-off in bonds, sorry, the, the, the rise in interest rates no. uh, that we've seen is going to be reversed as quickly as markets expect. I mean, I, th mm -hmm. I think that's possibly not going to happen. Second, I mean, if you look at the, how this translates across the Atlantic to the Bank of England, to the ECB, I mean, for the Bank of England, very different ballpark. Wage growth is obviously running much faster. They're not going to be able to cut at the same, uh, at the same time. But the markets are expecting cuts. They, they are. <laughs> I, think, I think really, I mean, realistically, we're, it's going to be the summer before the bank's able to do that. ECB, though, I think that's a different question because they don't have the same problem. The only thing that's stopping the ECB rate from cutting rates is the ECB itself. I mean, there's no, there's no reason why they shouldn't. So I think, you know, if, you, the, if I had to think about well, how we might shift our, for, our calls forward, the ECB is clearly the one where we think most, is most at risk, and, and that could come perhaps as soon as March. What's your take on Bank of Japan? Again, the fact that they said, look, we don't want to forward guidance, I don't know whether that's prudent or it just means that visibility is quite tough. Right. I mean, so I think our, our Japan economists are of the view that they're always going to be more cautious than the markets were recently reading into those, those kind of slightly hawkish remarks. Um, fact is that this is a once-in-a-generation once shot to get inflation back onto a kind of a 2% path, and the Bank of Japan doesn't want to mess it up. So I, I think they are going to be pretty cautious. Okay, so interesting. Jamie, thanks so much. Our Chief Europe Economist, Jamie Rush. Now, you can read Jamie's piece and, of course, get all of the latest from Bloomberg Economics. I suggest everyone does that because it's my go-to read in the morning. B-E-C-O, go. V echo, go. Bloomberg Economics, go on the function on the Bloomberg Terminal. Up next, Bloomberg Brief. This is Bloomberg.